Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first week of Topics in Digital Law Practice. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Um, I've got some housekeeping materials uh, to go over with you for the next five or so minutes, and hopefully that will give um, uh, more people time to show up as I'm watching the attendee list, um, like, like a little ticker going up and up and up. We were astonished and delighted that so many people uh, were interested in this course. Our expectations were maybe 50 or 100 might be interested, and we received over 700 uh, registrations. Um, and so it truly is a massive online open course, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So this is a picture of me so that um, I'm not just a disembodied, disembodied voice. Um, we're experimenting with uh, using a webcam uh, on this, but uh, we're concerned about uh, bandwidth issues. And so for the time being, um, it's going to be still pictures and uh, PowerPoints or um, demonstrations of websites. So Cali is the sponsor uh, host of your of this course. Uh, like I said, we're uh, a, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. We are, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. This is our 30th year of existence. Uh, Cali was incorporated in 1982 by the, uh, by the founding law schools of uh, Harvard and uh, University of Minnesota Law School. And today we have over 200 U.S. law schools as members. And we sit at the intersection of technology, uh, education, and legal education, sorry, uh, technology, education, and law practice, um, trying to provide um, research development software tools for uh, lawyers and law students and law faculty. And this course fits perfectly into our mission. We have uh, quite a number of uh, services. I'm not going to go into these. I, I do not intend this to be a, a commercial, but I just want you to know more about, about who, who this is coming from. We are probably most well known for our lessons in which we publish over 800 web-based tutorials. Um, you law students out there should be familiar with us. We are well known for our excellence awards, um, which law schools give an award to the student who receives the highest grade in the class and Cali recognizes that with a paper certificate as well as an online permanent URL in which the student can link to from their online profile. Um, uh, we're well known in the legal aid community for A to J Author, which is a software tool for automating um, legal form development, legal form uh, creation. And uh, you're going to hear more about that in uh, later weeks when Ron talks about that. Um, and many other things. So if you have any interest in what Cali is doing, um, by all means visit us. So why this course? Well, I put up two provocative books that have come out in the last couple of years just as sort of book ends to, to explain this. Um, uh, Suskin's The End of Lawyers and the, uh, the Carnegie Report. Uh, we, we definitely are in a crisis of sorts in legal education and maybe crisis is too strong a word but there's an awful lot of change uh, coming down the pike. And technology is a, uh, is a driver or uh, a player in that. And our thought was um, law students and law faculty don't get to see the same things that uh, lawyers do when they attend shows like ABA Tech Show and Legal Tech. I go to these shows and, um, and I see wonderful presentations from many of the people who will be speaking at this uh, for this um, uh, course, and I and I say, gosh, I wish I wish students could see this, or I wish faculty could, and uh, well, here's here's the solution to that. We can, we have invited those same people that have given talks on these topics uh, many times. They are all many of them are experts in their uh, area uh, of the subject they are talking about, and um, and the goals of this uh, are to are to give this sort of knowledge exposure to both law students and to law faculty. Now there's lots of schools that are already uh, providing courses, Law and Emerging Technologies, Technology and Innovation, um, and, I, and I recognize that, 
Um, but I want to encourage even more schools to do this. And so another goal of this course is to create a resource in which, which will uh, be made available to the entire legal education community and to encourage law schools to pay more attention to the realities of modern law practice. So those are our three, three goals. Give students access to up-to-date you know, knowledge, uh, uh, up-to-date tech about law practice. Inform law faculty about the changing nature of law practice so as to inform their teaching and to create an enduring resource that we can build on for future audiences. Now the solution, our solution for that is this course and it's inspired by the idea of something called a MOOC. That's M-O-O-C. And if I can click through to my next screen. What is a MOOC? Well, there's a great YouTube video which is linked from the course blog. And I'm not going to play it for you, but I, but I recommend that you would take a look at it. It's only four minutes. Um, and the, the, the short version of this is that a MOOC is a massive open online course. Now this qualifies as massive. There are up to 700 of you registered. It's open, which is to say we gave preference to, or we, we marketed this to law students and law faculty, but frankly anybody can sign up. And we have people signed up from all over the world. I've, I've seen registrants from, um, from Russia, from Taiwan, from Nigeria and Gambia, um, and um, uh, Welcome, folks, if you're uh, listening in either early in the morning or late at night. Um, we really appreciate you uh, coming on board. So the idea of a massive open online course is that the students, that is you, will do a lot of the work in, in the teaching of yourselves and each other. And we're going to manifest that in the homeworks, where we're going to send you out on the web and in other places to find and gather or create information that you will bring back to the homework wiki, which is at uh, TDLP, Topics and Digital Law Practice, by the way, uh, dot wikispaces.com. Now, none of you have been invited to join that wiki just yet. Uh, you have to be invited. We, it'll, it'll be closed in terms of who can edit. And obviously, we only want the people who are in this course to be able to edit it. But it will be open in terms of who can see it. In other words, open to the World Wide Web. I want to uh, show you a little bit about how we want you to interact with that wiki. And so I'm going to alt-tab over to it. So here I am at uh, tdlp.wikispaces.com. And um, I've reproduced the course um, uh, agenda here. But you'll see a link here for student homework page links. This is just a link that goes to the bottom of the page. And down here is, a, is an alphabet. And what I want you to do, once we send you this invitation, which we'll do right after the course. Um, we didn't send it to you before because we were afraid it would get lost in your spam folders. So by telling you that it's coming, you'll, you'll see it right after the course or within an hour. It takes a little while for uh, email to get pushed out. Um, and I want you to come to this wiki and, and do the following. First of all, I want you to create a link underneath the letter of your last name that will link to a page that you will create, which is where you will put all of your homework assignments. It's where you will copy and paste or type in the answers to the homeworks that we give you. So I'll demonstrate how you do that. So you would go to this page, and once you're allowed to do so, you would click Edit. I'm gonna, I was messing around with this before, that's why I got that little message. So I'm now inside a, essentially a word processor for the wiki. I'm going to pretend that my name is uh, um, Calvin um, Course Dude. All right. I'm going to highlight that and I'm going to create a link out of it. And what I want to do is make a link to another another wiki link to another wiki page and I'll just say add link. Now I can go visit this right now but I have to save this so that this Calvin course dude stays, stays here. So I'll hit save. It takes a moment and if I scroll down there's a link to this page which I haven't created yet. This is the way wikis work. You have to create a link that then creates the page. So I click on that 
It says, this page doesn't exist yet. You can create it by clicking the edit button. I will click that. And now here's where, here is where Calvin, oops, how about spelling it right? Course Dude is going to put his homework assignments. Blah, blah, blah. All right, I click Save. And now that page, which has been saved, and it basically belongs to you at this point. Um, um, the way a wiki works, though, is anybody can go into any page and edit. Um, and so, you know, we ask you to stick to your page for um, doing updates uh, to your homeworks. Um, and we'll be monitoring it to, uh, to make sure that um, spammers, vandals, or others um, don't cause us trouble. So back here on the uh, home page of the wiki, which I can always get to by clicking the logo, you'll see down here now there's a link for Calvin Course Dude. And when I click through that, there's the link to the page that I just created. Clear as mud? Good. All right. Let's head back to the PowerPoints. Uh, resume slideshow, John. Very good. I wanted to remind you all to take the pre-course survey. Um, though there is a link. There will be a link uh, at the blog, um, so you don't have to write this down or memorize this. Um, we need to. We want to know more about you. Um, just a little bit more. We promise we're not going to be sharing this information or selling your email address to anybody. We don't do that. Um, but the more we know about you and your expectations for the course. Um, the better we can respond. And uh, since this is an ongoing course, you know, we can respond uh, quickly to um, ideas, suggestions, questions um, that you might have. And speaking of questions, so after our invited guest speaker, Stephanie Kimbrough, uh, is finished speaking, we're going to have a 10 or 15 minute um, time period in which you can ask questions. Um, we can't unmute you all as um, I, I, I'm, I, I shudder to think what the cacophony of, of, of noise and, and feedback would happen. And so, so instead, we're, we're limiting your capability to typing questions into the question box, which I have an example on, your, on the screen right now. Um, uh, so when, you, when we get to that point or any time during the uh, presentation you have questions, you can type them in there. I've got a couple of Cali staff, Austin Greathouse and Sarah Glassmeyer, who are standing by to uh, either answer your questions if they're about sort of meta process about the thing, or to feed the questions to me so that I can ask them of Stephanie during our question and answer period. Um, we will also uh, attempt to deal with questions that we don't have time to get to afterwards, um, and we love your feedback. All right. So this is a nine-week course. Um, I call it a course, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's not a course where we're going to grade you, although we will be looking at your homeworks, and other people will be looking at your homeworks. And so there is a bit of a social pressure for you to perform in a way that impresses or at least demonstrates your knowledge to other people. All right? We hope that that sort of social pressure is enough for you to do the work and to do a good job of it. The first week... Our first week is uh, today with uh, vir the virtual law office as our topic, and we have as a, as a speaker uh, Stephanie Kimbrough. Now Stephanie is, uh, is, is, can definitely be declared an expert in this space. She's written a book on it. I recommend it to you. She has consulted with many law firms on this topic. Um, she has spoken many times on this topic. I've seen her several times, um, and I learned something uh, different and new each time. She's uh, uh, very serious and methodical about this, and, um, and, I, and I believe that she has um, information that is of interest and will be uh, educational for you as well. So that's my introduction. Uh, thank you for coming. We are delighted to have you here. I'm going to ask Austin to uh, send the screen over to uh, Stephanie, who will uh, begin her presentation. Okay. Hello, everyone. I mean, you can see me okay. Just for a minute here, I'll put on a webcam. Wave hello. Um, 
What I want to talk to you about today is virtual law practice and take a look at the future of online delivery methods. And what we're going to start out with is a look at the background, the marketplace, the changes that have been occurring that lead up to virtual practice, the growth of that in our legal profession. So right now, in, in the past five years or so, we've really seen a growth, a growing online market, what we call a late market for online legal services. A lot of non-lawyer um, legal service companies are coming into the space and providing these services to the public online. So we have LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer, um, U.S. Legal Forms, a lot of different ones out there. And you can just look at the numbers alone, you know, over 400,000 people in the U.S. Um, searching online through the LegalZoom website alone. That's just one of those providers. That's a huge number of people that otherwise would have been going potentially to a licensed lawyer for their legal needs. I think the growth of that has occurred because the concept of accessibility and customer service has changed for our clients, for the public. Back then they may have wanted to make an appointment and meet with us face to face uh, with their lawyer, but now their concept of accessibility is communicating in ways they communicate with their friends and family online, uh, can, what's convenient for them. They don't want to take time off of work, arrange for childcare, um, to take care of their needs. They're used to, at this point, shopping, selling, um, earning degrees online, even things that require you know, more confidentiality uh, in their transaction with other professionals, banking, investing, trading. The public has gotten used to doing these tasks online, and then they look to someone for their legal assistance, and they can't find lawyers necessarily online like they can find other professionals and other services. So those changes, plus the fact that this next generation of our clients are going to be even more digitally ingrained, um, lends itself to this growth of virtual law practice, or the online delivery of legal services. So right now we have what we call the Facebook generation. Um, a large part of my client base, for example, are in their 60s and 70s who will retire down to North Carolina um, and need their estate planning redone. And they are okay communicating with me online because they go online to talk to their grandkids on Skype or their grandchildren and children are on Facebook. Well, imagine this next generation of clients. They're going to be even more used to communicating this way. And when they go to look for legal assistance, they're going to expect to find it online like they would other products and services. So that's sort of a, a really quick <laughs> overview of the background um, that has you know, given forth this virtual law practice trend that we're seeing in the legal profession. So virtual practice is essentially a professional law practice, and it exists online. And it's the establishment of the attorney-client relationship all the way through to the rendering of the legal services and the payment for those services online. So that entire process, the entire relationship can be conducted within a secure digital environment. And there are a lot of different technologies that could be used to create a virtual practice environment. But the key component is the user portal, a secure client portal. And most of us are familiar with these because we do online banking. Anytime you register for a site that requires any form of security, you're doing you're using a client portal. You're creating a unique username, a unique password. And once you re register and log in that portal, it's encrypted and secure your transactions within that. And the background of this, the basis for this, it depends on cloud computing more specifically software as a service. And we don't have time in this presentation to go really in-depth on what is cloud computing, um, what is software as a service. But essentially it means that your law office data is being hosted by another third-party provider. And it's located on a server 
at a secure data center. So that's, that's sort of the structure of a virtual law practice. It's a secure client portal that's hosted by cloud computing. So there are two primary ways that lawyers are using virtual law offices or setting them up. And as John mentioned, I, I have um, sort of a broad background in this. I have operated my own virtual law office uh, for going on seven years now in North Carolina, and I deliver unbundled estate planning to my clients online. And my practice is completely web-based, so I don't actually meet with my clients in person. We just meet online within the secure environment. But the services that I deliver are unbundled or limited scope representation services to my clients. But in addition to my practice, I have helped other firms set up virtual law offices. And we're seeing a lot of growth in the hybrid virtual law firm where a traditional law practice uh, that's a brick and mortar structure is adding a virtual component to their traditional uh, practice. And what they'll do is they'll cultivate a completely online client base uh, where they'll deliver unbundled services. And then they'll also use the virtual law office, the secure client portal, as an, exist, as an amenity for their existing in-person clients. Um, and also as sort of a marketing strategy uh, to, to stay competitive. And we're seeing a lot more of these traditional law firms with a virtual office component spreading, um, at least here in the States, because they have an existing brand and they can really market a lot more easily than a completely um, web-based practice uh, like, like what I have. So to understand how the services are actually delivered within these two forms of virtual practice, um, we need to take a look at what unbundling is. And one of the speakers for this course, um, I think it's in the fourth or fifth week, is Richard Granite, and he's going to talk to you a lot more about unbundling of legal services. But just really quickly, so you understand what types of services are delivered this way, um, unbundling, the ABA Model Rule 1.2c is what allows for unbundling when it's reasonable under the circumstances, and most state bars have adopted some version of this rule, if not the exact version of the rule. And it basically means you're taking a legal task for your client and you're cutting it down into separate components and you're saying to the client, I will do X, Y, and Z, but you are responsible for uh, the footwork, for the rest of it, for, for the, these other components of that legal matter. Um, and there are a whole separate set of ethics issues and best practices, which I'm sure Richard will cover in his course, that you need to be aware of when you unbundle. But these are some sample unbundled services that could potentially be delivered through a virtual law office. So just to give you an idea, when a lot of people think of a virtual practice, they think more transactions based. And in my example, for my virtual law firm, um, you know, I do estate planning, so it is more transactions based. But there's a lot of potential to use web conferencing and other tools to do things um, like coaching and strategy with the client. Um, negotiating, online dispute resolution, all of these are unbundled services, limited scope a la carte services um, that could be used in a virtual office environment. So in addition to unbundling legal services, you also have online case and client management that's being used by these virtual law offices to communicate with other associates in the virtual firm with um, their virtual paralegals, virtual assistants, and with their clients. So they have a whole back-end law office um, that functions online. So I'm going to take you into a couple screenshots here, show you my practice, and actually take you inside a demo real quick and show you how I work with my clients online. So this is my virtual law office website, and you can see I have a new client registration button at the top. Um, and where my clients log in securely. And then I have some other things on my site, like I have a web calculator. I'm you know, developing a web advisor now that I'm going to add to this. So I try to have a lot of self-help and just general guidance on, on my website for prospective clients and for my existing clients. I'm going to take you out to what I see. So um, when my client registers, a new client registers, for example, they will request legal services. 
um, and this is their client portal, this is the inside. And what they will do is they will sign a click wrap agreement. And the courts have held that that is a binding and enforceable contract. And that click wrap agreement will explain the nature of unbundled services, the use of the technology, um, and that it's basically a limited scope engagement agreement, which is required for unbundling. And then the client clicks to accept that. They come inside here and request services. Then on my side, when I receive that request, um, I will look up at the top. If the person is not um, registered as being within my jurisdiction, then I will get a jurisdiction red flag that will remind me this client may not be within North Carolina where you're licensed. You need to double check the, this, the issue to make sure you can work with them. Um, so those little ethics and malpractice red flags are sort of built into my technology to help me avoid unauthorized practice of law. And so I'll check it. Now I've worked with clients, for example, in Ohio who had North Carolina real estate matters, but I was able to work with them online where it's convenient for them and to, to work with me. Um, but it, you know, it sent me that little warning just in case. So I would then find out some more information from the client, enter parties to the case. And you can see here I have a lot of different features on my dashboard. So I would go into a contact and add some parties. Then I can run a thorough conflict of interest check to make sure, you can see I, have, I can flag people as in conflict, as co-counsel, opposing counsel, different tags for different parties. Um, so I would make sure there's no conflict of interest check before I start working with them. And then I would add that for that new client, I would create an agreement for them. And you can see I can go into a matter, create an agreement, which would be a limited scope agreement, define how we're going to work together online. Um, and, and just work back and forth like that. So I get activity alerts on my smartphone that tell me when to log into the secure site. The clients can request uh, web conferences with me, phone calls. I have um, a calendaring system, a task system. I also can do different alternative fee arrangements. So for a client, I can do hourly rate, but usually I do fixed fee billing. I also do pro bono work online, and I can select any of those uh, for a client, and then I can send the client the invoice, and so the client is able to check their invoices and pay me online. Um, I even do payment plans and spread it out. So um, I don't want to spend you know too much time showing you, but just to give you an idea of the different features that the client can you know go in and request phone conferences, web conferences. Um, upload, download documents back and forth to each other. So there's a lot of different flexibility depending on you know, your client base, how you work with the client online. So for example, a large portion of my client base are in their 30s and 40s, and they just need estate planning. They've never had estate planning created. They have young children, so they want to set up guardianships. Um, they're completely comfortable just working within my virtual law office um, the, their client, their secure client account. But my older clients who will find me online when they, they go to Google, um, they will register, but then they'll want to have a web conference with me, see me face to face or talk to me, and then they'll go right back in. So it's sort of a, when you're a virtual law practitioner, you sort of have to be flexible in terms of using the technology to communicate with different, different clients and different client bases, depending on your practice area. Let me show you, that's just my form of practice, and mine's completely web-based. I want to show you a couple other screenshots of law firms to give you an idea of how many different ways virtual law practice could be used. So this is Rice Family Law, and they're in North Carolina, and uh, Mark Williams is the, the partner in this firm who initiated their virtual law office. It was created about three years ago. And he has a completely separate virtual law office that he uses, and he's kind of cultivated a unique client base. He will market to the individuals who are stationed in the military overseas who need secure family law services. Um, rather than using unencrypted email to communicate with them, he 
lets them use the secure client portal. And then he also uses it for his existing in-person clients because you know, he does a lot of family law litigation. But he'll use it as a way to provide them with the convenience of here are your documents in the case, here's your invoice, you can pay me online, but also in that whole you know, beginning to work with the client phase where you're gathering data. Rather than have them come into the office for multiple appointments uh, you know, with a paralegal before even meeting with him, he can take, use the virtual office to do a lot of that ahead of time, um, sort of in the client intake process. So he's, again, using the technology twofold to serve his clients. This is an example of a multi-jurisdictional virtual law firm. It's McGrath and Spielberger. And Jason McGrath is a lawyer, and he's in Charlotte, North Carolina. But he um, has expanded now that he's brought on two other associates, and they are delivering legal services in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Ohio. And they make use of a technology that uses a lot more document automation and assembly to serve that online client base. So it's a lot of the wills or much more uh, basic trans legal transaction documents he's doing with that doc assembly. And then the other ones, he, I believe they have two physical offices uh, where clients can come meet with them in person. But again, you see how you have lawyers who are licensed in multiple states. The potential to expand your client base you know, across multiple jurisdictions that can really be a competitive advantage, especially in a crowded legal marketplace like we have right now. So another example of the flexibility of this type of uh, technology, we have Rania Combs. She's a lawyer who lives in Chapel Hill, but she's actually licensed in Texas. And you know her husband got a great job uh, with a company here. So rather than take the North Carolina bar, she was able to continue to practice Texas law and work with her Texas clients while she lives in another state. Um, and you know there's some issues we're going to talk about when we briefly talk about ethics here, like unauthorized practice of law, residency requirements, bona fide office rules that you have to be aware of. But I've spoken with a lot of lawyers whose spouses are in the military, for example or have other positions where they need to move um, you know, across the state, even internationally. But they want to continue working with their clients. So the virtual law office gives them that type of, of flexibility in their career. So this is another law firm. This is Burton Law. And uh, Chad Burton created this firm up in Ohio. And they're looking to expand. And what he does when he um, brings on associates to the law firm. He gives them all an iPad when they first join as sort of a way to say, this is how we're communicating, and this is how we're communicating with our clients. And um, they have a client portal for their clients, but they don't necessarily market themselves as delivering legal services online. They're much more of a virtual law firm structure that you may have read about, um, such as Virtual Law Partners, which started out in California in 2007 or Axiom Law or Ryman Law, where it's a virtual law firm in the sense that the lawyers have created sort of a conglomeration of lawyers that allows them to, to pool their resources and use technology to collaborate and refer amongst themselves and spread out over a state or multiple states. And they're moving more towards the online delivery within a secure client portal, but that's not really the focus. But again, they use the technology to create a virtual firm structure. Along those same lines as Burton Law is ClearSpire, which I'm sure you've all read about in the news. Um, they're a DC virtual law firm model that's really using technology to deliver to their clients. You see they have a client login at the bottom of their site. Um, but they're expanding quite rapidly, um, almost like the, the, a, a larger multi-jurisdictional law firm. So just a couple um, you know, examples for you. There are a whole lot more out there of pure play virtual law offices, hybrid virtual law firms, multi-jurisdictional. Um, and these trends are, are only increasing because the market need is so clearly there. So um, I'm looking forward to the questions. And usually when I do these presentations, I stop and ask for questions in the middle. But uh, I think we're going to wait and hold those off to the end. So let me dive into the meaty part, which is the ethics issues. The way that I break down ethics issues in virtual law practice are into two steps. The first is, 
choosing the technology and researching the provider. Um, and then once you've actually decided, this is the structure of virtual delivery that I'm going to have, and this is the technology I'm using, and you've implemented it, then how are you actually going to use the technology on a daily basis? Like what are the best practices that will help you avoid um, malpractice issues and ethics violations? So the main ethics rule that comes up in virtual practice is confidentiality. And this is model rule 1.6a. And most state bars have adopted uh, some, it's almost always in 1.6a of the state bar. But essentially what it says is, as lawyers, we have a duty to protect the confidentiality of our client data, to safeguard this data, and we have to use reasonable care. And so the question is, what constitutes reasonable care? And the way that I see this is your reasonable care is conducting due diligence in researching that technology provider and reviewing their service level agreement or user agreement. Now the trick here is that because virtual law practice depends on cloud computing, you have to understand the flow and transfer of data in cloud computing to really be able to research and do your due diligence um, when you're looking at a technology provider. So you need to understand that when your clients enter the data into your, your system, it's then accessible potentially by, by that technology provider whose service you've subscribed to. But then that technology provider is most likely leasing server space that's owned by another company. So there's a data center somewhere that's owned by a company and it houses servers. Your law office data is on those servers. So there may potentially be two third parties that are going to have access to that law office data. So you need to be aware of any agreements between your technology provider and the company that owns um, the data center where the servers exist. So you need to understand that relationship, the transfer of data. Does the data stay encrypted? at rest in transmission, who has access, what is the company's policy, should there be you know, government um, civil search and seizure action, do they let you know. Um, there's some issues here in, in the U.S. with the Patriot Act. I know uh, the Canadian Bar has counseled its lawyers to be careful about hosting data uh, that is stored on, uh, you know, using a product that has the data stored on servers here in the U.S. because of the Patriot Act and its broad reach. And I gave John a, um, a chapter on, on ethics to share with you all that will go into a lot of this much more detail um, than what I can do in this presentation. But you need to be aware of a lot of these issues. Data return and retention policies. Look for these things in the service level, level agreement. Will your law office data, when it's returned to you, Will it be in a tr uh, format that's compatible, that will transfer into another system? So if you get it all back and it's unusable, then you haven't, you haven't, um, you're, not, you're not able to protect or safeguard your client's property. So look at backups. Are there backups, how often export features or offline versions of the software? Make sure there's something like geo-redundancy of servers or data escrow. Just review a lot of these within the, the service level agreement. And like I said, I can't go too much in depth into these, but there are some resources you can turn to for guidance. And one of the newest of these is ILTSO, it's the International Legal Technology Standards Organization. And last April at the ABA Tech Show, they released a set of standards that can help guide lawyers in terms of doing the due diligence in researching a, a, a provider. And then also in terms of how do you use the technology, if it's on a mobile device, using um, Wi-Fi, what are the, the most secure ways to practice law online? And these things are found in these standards. So you might want to check that out. The ABA's e-lawyering task force also has guidelines. And there are a lot of different other resources that are emerging to help provide lawyers with this type of guidance to protect the, the confidentiality of their clients' data. So that's the first step, is just researching the provider and the technology. The second part of the ethics is then, after you've implemented it in your practice, 
how are you actually going to use it to avoid these risks? So there's unauthorized practice of law. I showed you how in my system I have that jurisdiction check um, that helps me with that. But just knowing that when I create my website, I have North Carolina plastered all over it. There's absolutely no question to any other state bar or any other person in the public as to where I am licensed to practice law. So there are different tricks like that that you can use to develop your website and in your advertising that can help you to avoid UPL issues that might come up in virtual law practice. But with a lot of these ethics considerations, they're really no different than what a traditional law firm has to consider these days in terms of use of technology, advertising. A lot of traditional firms without a virtual law office have to be aware of online methods of, of advertising and the risks um, that are in there. It's just for a virtual practice, the risks may be more heightened. So um, that said, we talked about residency requirement of bona fide office rules. Depending on what state you're going to practice law, um, you need to be aware of their potential restrictions. New Jersey being the most well known uh, has a bona fide office rule that would require a lawyer, even if they want to practice like I do from a home office, they would have to put that home office contact information on any advertising and website. Um, they may be reconsidering that, that rule and thinking about changing it as of this week. Um, but there are a lot of different states that have residency requirements. If you are doing litigation-based work, for example, you could not just provide a PO box address for your virtual law firm. You would have to have a physical brick and mortar address. So you need to be aware of those different state bar restrictions. Um, I explained how I established the attorney and client relationship online, how I define the scope of representation with a limited scope engagement agreement. And again, these can all be transferred online. Um, I can check conflict of interest on both online and offline clients. And one of the questions I get a lot is about the authentication of an online client's identity. How can I confirm that they are who they say they are. Um, how can I judge competency if I'm not meeting with them face to face? And this is my solution. I will just hold a web conference and I will see them essentially face to face and I can look at their eyes and their body language and I can, can tell from our discussion pretty much anything I could tell when I worked at a traditional law firm. Um, so that's typically what I will do to, to address that issue. But in terms of verifying the client's identity, I would just have them um, provide a driver's license, hold it up to the screen so I can verify it that way. Or there are old school methods of doing it, like I could scan in a driver's license and have them scan it and sign it underneath and upload it to the virtual law office. So there are different ways of authenticating the identity. But you know, I've spoken with different ethics gurus um, of different state bars and with the ABA. And the bottom line is, is, as lawyers, if they are signing an agreement that says they are who they say they are, we do not have any duty beyond that to run a background check on them for fraud. We can't do that with every case um, just because it's online. We do not have that level of duty. Um, and also, with a lot of the documents that you are providing to clients online, in order for them to be legally enforceable, they have to be executed in front of a notary and usually two other witnesses. So there's three individuals there who are also verifying the client's identity before those documents can be executed. So there are a lot of different ways that you can handle it depending on your state bars requirements, the, the practice area that you're in. Um, and just to be frank, a, a virtual law office is not practical for some practice areas. You can't unbundle complex um, litigation matters. You can't handle criminal defense matters, uh, you know, complex child custody or support. You can't do these types of law that require continuous and ongoing representation that cannot be unbundled uh, ethically and it can't be handled completely online. That's where a hybrid virtual law firm would implement a virtual office but still meet with the client face to face. Um, so again, a lot of these ethics considerations depend on the particular structure of virtual law practice that you've chosen. 
So two, you need to understand using internet tools to build the online client base. That's your marketing rules. I don't have time to go into all of that, but 7.1 through 7.5 of the model rules. A lot of different state bars are addressing these different ethics issues, such as daily deals. Um, North Carolina, South Carolina, and New York recently um, created ethics opinions saying their lawyers could use daily deal sites like Groupon and Living Social to advertise online with certain caveats, of course. But the state bars are just now grappling with some of these newer online advertising models. So it's something that if you do virtual practice, you really need to be aware of um, how each state is addressing these. And each state is also going through a process of defining reasonable care uh, and how they want to require their lawyers to go through that process. Pennsylvania recently uh, published an ethics opinion on um, cloud computing that had a list of minimum requirements to constitute reasonable care under their version of 1.6a. Uh, North Carolina's is going to go through now their software as a service ethics opinion and they got rid of the minimum requirements and just went with a broad reasonable care based on the circumstances. So you need to check with your state bar and if you're a multi-jurisdictional law firm you may have to look at differing ethics opinions across the board to figure out how you're going to be able to comply. So the bottom line is, you know, how can you ethically handle the matter online? Keep that in mind on a case-by-case -case basis. Understand the technology. But if you want to do this kind of practice, you have to really enjoy keeping up with technology and security issues. I subscribe, for example, to a hacker magazine called 2600. I understand maybe a third of it, <laughs> but it gives me an idea of, you know, the security risks that are out there and what they're thinking and how I can protect my firm and my clients. Um, so just really quick, because I know we're running into out of time when we have questions, let me just show you what future online delivery is going to be. Less static websites, much more interactive websites for law firms, disaggregated legal services, Take a look at Rosen Law Firm. He's been doing this for a couple years now. Web advisors, web calculators, radio shows, video, uh, self-help, free self-help, unbundling, uh, client portals. Um, that's the type of firms that we're looking at who are going to survive in the next five to ten years. Branded network concepts. Rocket Lawyer just got several million dollars worth of funding from Google Ventures. They are taking off. There's the potential here for lawyers with virtual law firms to collaborate with these branded network concepts. LegalZoom doing the same thing, forming a network of lawyers. Uh, MyLawyer.com is another one. Um, so be aware of these branded networks and how you may have to be collaborating with them in the future for, for potential clients. Fair outcomes. Some of these systems, you might want to play around with these to get an idea of, of of future tools that us that lawyers we can use. This is based on game theory. It allows two parties to settle their monetary dispute before, right before the eve of trial. Um, and it gives them those online tools to be able to do that. There are also different AI systems that are developing that, that will, like, for example, you might want to take a look at Neota Logic that will allow um, lawyers to compile legal data to help them make legal decisions that they can make for their clients. So uh, some new technologies are starting to develop. And you also might want to look at the UK, which is experiencing some of these changes at a much faster rate because of the Legal Services Act. We have quality solicitors putting kiosks and, and video kiosks in bookstores. Um, so a lot of changes going on over there we might start to see over here as well. Just a couple questions for you to think about um, in terms of how you know you might practice law uh, in the future, how you might work with clients online, and and um, I think we'll just turn to questions now because I, I think I ran sure. over my a lot of time. <laughs> No, the, you could uh, clearly, Stephanie, you could teach this and uh, you, you could give uh, five or six or 10 or 20 um, presentations and, and, and not exhaust all the, all, the, all the things that we can learn about. 
you're, you're right. We Our goal is for this to be one hour long, um, so we're going to quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly run through a couple of questions. Um, um, and then I've got some uh, uh, homework housekeeping to, to give the folks. So um, um, first of all, yes, this is being recorded. It will be posted. Yes, we are going to get the PowerPoints uh, from Stephanie and post them to the blog. Um, I'm almost not sure where to start. So um, is, uh, are, would you be willing to sh share your click wrap agreement with us as well so that we could post that for people to look at? Sure. Or if they, uh, sure. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so who created your website? Um, and, well, the, and, the website? And is that a commercial package? And, and no, it's a company called Rowboat Media um, that I chose to create, the, develop a website itself. Um, and, you know, in terms of startup costs, it, you know, it can run anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000 to create a static website for it. But then uh -huh. what the web designer does is they create a link out to the software as a service that you subscribe to. So I use total attorneys and um, the, when they click to register it takes them to the secure link and that software that I showed you that was the total attorneys platform that's behind essentially the static website. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that a good idea here would be for a student to run through the presentation and, and call out all of the um, URLs that you talked about and to post them in, uh, in the wiki um, or to send them to me and then I'll post it back to the blog. And so, so I, I, I put that out there as a challenge to one of the students to do um, before one of my, me or one of my staff get to it if they, if they would want to do that. Um, Um, here, looking through the questions. So isn't, um, you know, for, for the relatively non-technical uh, attorney, um, can't, we, can't they just wait because eventually uh, law, uh, companies will show up to sort of handle the, com the technical complexity for them, you know, within the next uh, couple of years so they don't have to uh, become conversant in cloud computing and encryption technology and stuff like that? I don't think you have to right now. Um, if you can use email um, and pretty much what you use in terms of technology in your personal life, you know, Facebook and Skype and, and, and just regular email, if you can use those things, you can use um, a virtual law office platform. It's, it's not that difficult. Um, any type of web-based application anymore, especially these legal software as a service platforms are very intuitive. They're developed so that you know the lawyer can just use them like they would any other install practice management software. So there there really isn't a huge you know technical curve that you have to get over or comfort level to be able to do this. And the same goes for the clients as well. If they use email, they, they should be fine with it. But it's it's encrypted, it's secure and there was the ABA ethics opinion that came out in August 11-459 um, that talks about unencrypted email being used in, in the workplace environment. But it hits that if the lawyer knows there's some risk that a third party could access that confidential you know, email, that they should use a more secure encrypted system. And I, you know, I take that and I look at virtual law offices and the way that they more securely communicate with clients and I see it almost as an, something that's going to be necessary for lawyers to do. Excellent. So let me let me turn that around, turn the question around and say, do the students in law school today who we generally right here guys out there in practice, are, are they at, a, at an advantage in this new virtual practice space? I think so, definitely. They're, they're most likely more used to communicating um, that way and it gives them an advantage if they go and in, into a firm they could introduce this concept 
to maybe the older, more traditional um, lawyers, or they could suggest that, hey, let me take the initiative and I'll set up a virtual office and I'll start cultivating a client base that's just online, doing some of this basic legal transaction work, you know, and start building that for the firm. And you know, that, you know, for a law student, understanding how this works and being the person that introduces it to the firm helps them get that competitive advantage. I think that that would be a really, you know, wise move. Excellent. How long, how long did you practice before you became a virtual practitioner? Um, I think I was in the firm about three years before I left um, and went out on my own. And one of my big motivators for doing that was, uh, you know, personal reasons. The flexibility that it gives me in terms of better work-life balance. I have a young family, so um, I need that. But also I found that my clients also need that flexibility, they communicate with me and I can see it on when they register and when they're uploading and, and doing things on my um, their client side. They prefer to work with me early in the morning or late at night. They don't want to take time off of work to handle their legal needs because it's it's expensive to do that. So um, if the convenience goes both ways for both I think the legal professional and and my clients. But the other reason I, I went out and did this was because I saw a market need for folks who are just, you know, from lower to, to middle class individuals who really can't afford the traditional billable hour. And what a virtual law practice lets the lawyer do is provide um, a more cost effective service for, for certain legal needs. So um, you can use the technology to sort of streamline the work, cut down on the costs, um, and let the client do some of the footwork to save themselves some money. So I got frustrated working in a traditional firm having to turn people away who couldn't afford the billable hour fee, but they didn't qualify for legal aid either. So I sort of saw this as a way of filling in that gap of increasing access to justice. So I think it has a lot of potential as a, a form of online delivery to meet the access to justice problem that we have in our country. I couldn't agree more and um, we're going to have a, a speaker uh, talk about that in one of the uh, one of the course sessions. Uh, Stephanie, I want I want to thank you. This was absolutely wonderful. I learned um, even more from the, than the first time I heard you speak and there are still lots of questions piling up but we're we're already three minutes over and I've got a few uh, bits of uh, homework assignment uh, housekeeping to do um, and what we'll try to do is uh, get answers to your questions and either post them on the blog or, or find some, some other way. Um, so thank you very much and thank you also for sharing the chapter in your book which, which we will also will uh, post um, to the blog. Well thank you for having me. All right. So folks, um, in the last few minutes let me give you your, your homework assignment. The goal of these homework assignments is for you to uh, do some work, no more than an hour, I would hope even less, um, that both benefits you in the doing of it and benefits the class in the sharing of it. And so your, your assignment is uh, twofold here. Uh, I want you to create two lists in part one. The first one is, is, is at least five good things or five advantages to running a virtual law practice. You know, what are the advantages over an entirely office-bound practice? What are the efficiencies gained, the money made or saved? Think about that. At least five, uh, ten would be wonderful. You know, do your David Letterman best. Uh, the second list is five things, or at least five things, that are uh, disadvantage disadvantageous or inefficient or problematic or uh, troublesome about running a virtual law practice. In other words, what I'm asking you to do is contemplate what could go wrong. What could possibly go wrong? What mistakes can you make? What issues could crop up with your clients and so on and so forth? Create those lists and put them into, the, into your homework wiki page um, and um, everybody else will also be able to uh, look at them. Um, I'm uh, holding you to your honor not to wait till a few people have done it and then just copy and paste. Um, do your own work, of course. Um, Part two of the homework is I want you to search the web, easy enough, and find at least three definitions for virtual law practice or digital law practice or e-lawyering. And uh, copy and paste those definitions, and I'm assuming a paragraph or two here, fair use, uh, into your homework wiki. 
you know, and then um, uh, put a link in there as well that links to where you found it. In other words, always show your work. Um, one small point about homeworks, if you possibly can, add a progress bar to your name when you uh, finish a homework, which is to say if, um, here, here, let me find it. When you, when you finish a homework assignment, then you can go to your, go to your name inside the wiki, and I'm going to have to scroll up and hit edit. And let's say Calvin Course Dude, who was our sample here, finished it. You know, and I'm going to put a one there to indicate that Calvin has finished uh, homework assignment one. And then I hit save. And what that does is it provides users or viewers of the wiki a shorthand to see you know, what you've completed and, um, and, and, if, and whether or not they should click through your name to see the results of your um, finished homework. All right, we're, we're coming into the home stretch here. Um, there were a whole bunch of questions about the course, like uh, CLE credit. No, we're not providing CLE credit. This is uh, the first time we're doing this course, and so we're sort of experimenting, and we're not sure how, how it's all going to work out. Um, we may look into that in uh, future iterations of this course. As much as possible, if we get lots of questions, we won't email you. We may not email you directly back. What we'll do is gather those questions into this FAQ, frequently ask questions, and we'll uh, post them on the blog so that uh, you can see the answers. So don't take our lack of responsiveness for uh, ignoring you. We we will we love all of our students, um, but we are few people to to the hundreds of you out there, um, and so we will use the web for what it is for, to be the, the ability to communicate with you via this method. So it's 2.07. We went a few minutes over. Um, I'll try to uh, capture those back in future classes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And um, see you next week, same time. Goodbye.